morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our second webinar, which we're addressing uh, trauma-informed care. Just a little bit about sacred safe spaces. Uh, we are American Baptist Churches of New Jersey, and we are trying to equip the church and faith leaders with the ability, the knowledge and the ability to help prevent and heal our communities experiencing domestic violence and sexual assault and all the other violence that we see in our communities. Our vision for the church is to be a healthy, beloved community where peace, mutual respect, justice and love are upheld for all. What we're hoping through our Sacred Safe Spaces ministry is that we will help faith leaders, congregations, and neighborhood groups to work together because they understand the resources that each have and will be able to create a compassionate healing community, uh, which will become a safe place within that community and within that church. Uh, today we have Tom Mulane who's gonna talk about trauma-informed care. Many times we overlook the trauma that somebody has gone, gone through with the abuse and all the activities that they have experienced. So today we're gonna look at that and look at if we see that, then what, are, what is it that we can do to help that person or that family? I'd like to welcome Tamu and she'll tell you more. Thank you, Reverend Estelle. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with everyone about trauma-informed care. Um, it's a term that is coming up more and more, but we should have been serving people from this platform since the beginning. Um, I do have, well, quickly, just a little bit about me. I guess I should do that. I have my own, I'm a CEO of an organization called Healing Wounds, where we do work in serving survivors around domestic violence, sexual abuse, um, and mental illness. So this has been, I've also have a history, a background where I've done therapy counseling, slash counseling um, for over 13 years. Uh, where I work with survivors of domestic violence, sexual abuse, and child sexual abuse that also had addiction issues um, as well as mental illness. So this is my area that I'm very passionate about as well as being a survivor of all of those things as well. So I love the work that I do. So let's get right into it. The first thing I want to ask you is why? And I know, no, I don't want you to answer that question in a chat box or uh, Q&A, but I want you to think about it. Why? Why do you want to be, why, why are you an advocate? Why do you want to become an advocate? Why are you doing this work? What's your reason and what's your intentions? Um, and that's very important to answer um, that question. You must answer that why question because it makes a difference in how you serve those that you are seeking to serve. Um, and I know that this is around domestic violence, but also know that domestic violence and sexual abuse go hand in hand. So if you're serving someone with domestic violence, there's a likelihood where you're gonna to have to deal with the sexual abuse as well, because many times they go hand in hand. Um, so what is your, what is your reasoning? And I, I ask that and I ask people to always look at that because I know many individuals, one in particular, she was a survivor um, of domestic violence and she's been in the field of domestic violence for a very long time, um, doing legal work, doing other kinds of things for survivors. But her reasoning for wanting to do this work was because she was a survivor and she wanted to get back at the batterers. She loathed batterers, hate them. So she felt like if she worked with survivors, she could somehow get back at those batterers or get back at the batterer that abused her. So her intentions were not correct. Therefore, many times she didn't serve survivors in a trauma-informed way. She actually 
hurt them a lot of times. She hindered um, their growth because she had her own agenda. So that's why I asked you the question of why. Why do you want to do this work? Why do you want to serve clients? And if your agenda is right, then you'll be able to serve them in a trauma-informed way, which we're going to talk about throughout this webinar. But if your agenda is just to hurt someone else because you're still angry, or if your agenda is something else, you know, it could be something else that has nothing to do with the client, I want you to really think about that and see if this is really going to work for you. Will I be able to serve them in, an, in a trauma-informed manner? So just something, like I said, I don't want you to respond to me what your intention is. This is just for you to understand for yourself. So I first want to look at what is the definition of trauma? What is trauma? So the word trauma is used to describe experiences or situations that are emotionally painful and distressing and that overwhelms people's ability to cope. So we, we must, when we talk about providing trauma-informed services, we must understand what trauma is and have an understanding about it. And how does trauma, how can it affect us? Um, it can cause us to have intense emotions. It can cause us to be unhappy. It can cause loneliness. It can cause anxiety, anger, irritability. Um, it can also cause us to have repetitive stress. It can affect our moods. Um, some people have anxiety disorders. It can affect our experience of chronic pain. There are a lot of diseases that they found now that are caused through because of the effects of trauma. I know fibromyalgia is one of them. A lot of autoimmune diseases are caused because people have experienced trauma. So it's all connected. It even has an ability to control our food intake or whether lack of. So trauma can affect a person's whole self. And if we don't understand that, it can affect how we serve them once again. Um, just real quickly, not to get too deep into it, but you know, when we, I've heard people say, you know, why did she act like that? Or why didn't she tell someone? Or why didn't she call the police? Well, we understand trauma and how it affects the brain. And when we look at the amygdala, or if you want to call it the brain stem, when trauma comes about, they either go to three things, the freeze, fight, or flight mode. A person either going to fight their way out, they're going to freeze up, or they're going to run. You know, so if we understand that when we see someone and say, well, why didn't she leave? Or why didn't she fight? Or why didn't she call the police? Understand how trauma affects the brain. And if you get that and understand that, we won't ask those why questions to a survivor. We should never ask them that. And that's not being trauma, um, trauma informed to ask someone why. Why you never tell? She has her reasons and we should never put that on her or him. Let me make that clear because we know that men can be abused as well. We should never make that a part of our conversation when talking to a survivor. So with that says, what is trauma-informed care? What is it? Trauma-informed care means treating the whole person, the whole person, not just a piece, the whole person, taking into account their past trauma and the resulting coping mechanisms when attempting to understand behaviors and treat the patient. So we have to understand, have, we have to have the ability to understand everything, or maybe not everything, but more than just what we see on the surface, right? We got to be able to serve them in a way that is helpful to them and not just looking at their behaviors and saying, oh, well, he's an alcoholic, well, she's an alcoholic. Well, they deserve this and understand why, and I hate the term alcoholic, by the way, but um, understanding why they drink or understanding why they use drugs or understanding why they're so angry. It, it's interesting because I think about myself as being, as a survivor, and no one, when I was young, I was just a problem child. 
no one ever asked me, um, would this something happen? Or maybe there's something else wrong. They never asked the question. All they saw was my outside behaviors. All they saw was my addiction. They never asked what was going on internally. And we tend to do that with individuals. You know, we never look per se, you know, um, on the inside. We just look at what we see on the outside. Um, who should receive trauma-informed care? Any individual that have experienced trauma. And that could be a DV survivor, a sexual assault survivor, child abuse survivor, someone that has experienced grief and loss, you know, that could be far and wide. Anyone that has experienced some form of trauma that has affected their life and ch changed how they function in the world. Those folks should receive trauma-informed care. Bottom line. Why is it so important to serve individuals from a trauma-informed model? Let's have to shift this here so I can see my screen. For many years, we have provided therapy and advocated for survivors by just looking at the behaviors and not the whole individual. We did not look at all the pieces of the person like how doctors treat physical pain today. I, I just think it's interesting. You know, when we, when we look at high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, we treat these things for the most part with medication, right? Treating the symptoms and not truly looking deep into the problem. Um, we don't, you know, we just say with high blood pressure, okay, we give them a pill. But we don't look at, truly look at how someone is eating or truly look at the other stuff. We just give a pill for everything. We give insulin, we give pills, and we say, you're gonna be on this for the rest of your life. But basically, we use a Band-Aid to service people, which is never effective. But trauma-informed care provides either counselor slash therapists or advocates with the opportunity to look beyond the surface of a person in order to serve them more accurately. It allows us to see them as a person, not just as an abused woman or an abused man, um, not just someone that needs us to come and rescue them, <laughs> but needing someone to support their process and listen to their needs, wants, and desires. You know, I, I've come across so many people that want to rescue <laughs> survivors. We're, we're not there to rescue them. We're there to serve them and to help them. And that's once again why I asked you in the beginning, what's your why? <laughs> You're looking to rescue, you'll never provide trauma informed services because you'll have your own agenda about what you want it to look like. When we are providing trauma informed care, we must be one, patient, 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 patient. I was. I know I, I, it's funny, I tell folks all the time, stop watching Law and Order, <laughs> even though I watch it myself. But every time I hold certain classes, people always want to tell me about a Law and Order case or something. But it was interesting. I watched Law and Order the other day, which I do love the show. But there was a case about a young lady who was with this famous man who abused her. And people were definitely um, struggling with that because he was a famous man. But at the same time, the, um, the detective wanted to push the survivor to press charges, to go to court. Like she basically pushed her because she had her own agenda and the survivor did not want that. She wasn't ready, but she pushed her. And then he ended up getting charged and ended up going to jail. And at the end of the show, she said, you, she said to the detective, the, vic, the survivor said to the detective, you ruined my life. She said, I didn't ask you to do this. You ruined my life. You took away my choice. And that's what we do. 
sometimes. We take survivors' choices away from them. That is not providing trauma-informed care. So we have to be patient. We have to walk this walk with them. Something that many of us struggle with, um, patients, because we want people to leave now. We tell people to call the police now. And then we tell them you need to go to counseling now. But it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. It's not our agenda. It's theirs. Something we really need to think about when we talk about this why. Also, I want to tell you, please don't assume that every therapist slash counselor, psychologist, and psychiatrist are trauma informed. Please never assume that. I, um, many years ago, I did some counseling work at um, a high school in Atlantic City. And they had, um, which I thought was awesome, they had a counseling center, one of the popular hospitals in Atlantic City, they had a counseling center in the high school. So they had a psychologist that would see the students there for many things. So one day we get a call um, where he asked if we can have a counselor come out to the school. Now he was a psychologist, class counselor, that's what he was doing, but he asked for someone to come. So I was the one that went. And I tell you, <laughs> there was nothing trauma informed about this individual. And um, he apparently has been doing the, this work for a long time. Who am I to dispute that? But when he saw me, he said, look, and he gave me this cocky look that made me very upset, but I was glad at the same time that he called. He said, look, you know, I'll see these young ladies and these young men and I'll talk to them about stuff. But as soon as they want to start talking about that stuff, you know, abuse and, and he did like this, he shunned them off. He said, when they start talking about that, I tell them, no, 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 I don't talk about that. And he said, I, that's when I decided I'll just call y'all to handle that. And he's literally flinging his hand like this to me. And I'm like, wait, wait, is he? Because what made me upset about it is the way that he's talking to me. I know for sure he was talking to them that way because he said to me, as soon as they started talking about that abuse and, you know, the abuse from their boyfriends and being sexually abused, I told him, I, I don't do that. I don't, I don't talk about that. And he just flung his hand. So totally let me know he was not trauma informed at all. But I was very, very, very thankful that he called us because he could have screwed those young men and young ladies up worse and could have totally took them over the edge more than where they already were. You know, and I have to say, when I started to see them, they were so happy to see me. And you know, so I, I was grateful for that, but it just lets me know we cannot assume that every therapist, counselor, psychologist, and psychiatrist are trauma-informed, because a lot of them are not. And we're going to talk about a little later some things you can look at and some questions you can ask to see if someone is trauma-informed, because it's not as simple as black and white. It, it really isn't. So you have to kind of do some homework. So we're going to talk about that a little later. So there are five components to providing trauma-informed care. The first one is safety. Ensuring that the individual will have physical and emotional safety by speaking to them. How can this begin to be accomplished? And that's by making sure that the common areas of an office, or and or a church is welcoming and that their privacy will be respected. That's a huge piece. You know, I, I was on the, the last call, I mean, the last webinar when you had Adrian, Adrian Simkin um, speaking with you and we were talking about making sure that there's information 
um, in the front of the ch in the front of the church or in the billboards, just making it feel welcoming and like a safe space and people that they come in contact with that they can feel comfortable speaking with them and not judge. You know, especially when we're talking about in a church aspect, they they can't feel like they're being judged because if they feel that judgment off the back. They're not coming back and they're not going to trust you with their life, with their, what's going on in their world. You know, one of the things that came to me, um, what if you had someone that uh, came to you, came to your church, you know, that was married and that said to you, they wanted to leave their husband because they were being abused and that a few weeks ago, he raped her. And now she wants to get an abortion, you know? So it's like all those dynamics. So, you know, you're in the church and you're thinking about your views and your values, but yet this young lady is coming to you and she felt some kind of safety in you, but now she tells you this, what are you going to tell her? What are you going to do? How are you going to serve her? She's telling you she's pregnant. And they're, they're members of the church, so you know our husband, you know, and she's telling you he's abusive and he raped me because, yes, husbands can rape their spouse, their wife. Yes, and also their wife can rape a husband. I just want to make that clear. And she tells you this. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? Are you going to judge her or are you going to bring her in with love so that she can begin to continue to find safety in you and find safety in your leadership. You know, so that's a, to me, that's one of the most important pieces is, sa is safety. Being able to safely come and talk to you, knowing that you're going to hear me, you're going to respect me, you're not going to judge me, and I can go further in having a conversation with you or with someone else, however you direct order, you know, direct me to go huge piece. Number two, choice. <laughs> it's all about choice. Survivors should always have the choice. The individuals must have choice over their decisions as well as control over what the outcome should be. They should have a choice, a say, the bigger part of the say is not the main, the, the major part of what's going to happen, sorry about that, in their life. We sometimes like to tell people what they should do because they are being abused and we act like we know what is best for them. But honestly, we don't know what is best for them. They know what's best for them. Not us. They know all about his, his rituals. They know what he would do to them. They know all the threats that he said to them. He might have already attempted to kill them. Like, they know. We don't know. And lastly, in providing that trauma-informed services, the individual must be provided with a clear and appropriate message about their rights and responsibilities. So in... Finding a therapist, a counselor, or being an advocate, we must be very clear about sending the right message to them that this is all about them, their rights, their responsibilities, and we're here to serve them. Once again, it's not about us. It's not about what we want to see happen. It's about them. Next, in building a trauma and uh, providing trauma-informed care or finding a trauma-informed uh, counselor, therapist, they must understand collaboration. I, this is one of the hardest pieces I find that people have, especially people in positions. When we talk about a therapist, a counselor, psychiatrist, a psychologist, or even sometimes advocates, <laughs> you know, we want to have that power position. This is not about power. Power struggles should never exist when providing trauma-informed services. 
It's about collaboration, not power. Our goal is to always collaborate with the survivors in order to bring about supportive relationships between us and the individuals that we are seeking to serve. Therefore, making decisions with, with them, not for them. I've heard so many people wanting to make the decisions for them and when they come up with treatment plans and this is what I'm, we're gonna have you to do and you need to do this and you need to do that. No. Do you understand that they have been in an abusive relationship where more than likely they had no, no sense of choice. There was no collaboration. So now they're coming to us as counselors, therapists, advocates, supporters, and now we're gonna take away their choice and collaboration as well? No. We're giving it, letting them know, no, it's yours to have and we're just here to support you. Once again, it is their choice regarding the final decision. Whatever they decide to do, leave, stay, whatever, it's their choice. We're just there to support. That's it. I've been in the field for over 13 years, you know, and I've just seen so many professionals push survivors to do things that they wanted them to do. And it just, and, and what I, even worse, what I've seen is when they've pushed them to, to, to do their agenda, when the survivor did not do their agenda, there was now a problem. They no longer wanted to serve them at least wholeheartedly or 100%, or they, if they're, depending if they're an agency, they put that they were non-compliant, or I've even heard them call them stupid where I had to now defend survivors, but you know, all these different things would come out of their mouth because they had their own agenda. And we must understand it is 100% about them, which is there to serve in any way possible and to support them in any way possible. And if they wanna leave, we'll support their process. And if they wanna stay, we'll support their process. I'm providing therapy to someone now. She doesn't want to leave. She wants to stay. So you know how I support her process? I support her process and just being safe and at home and also getting some time to take care of herself while she's there until she can figure out her next step. We don't talk about, you know, what you, you need to get out of there. You need, mm -mm, because that's not what she's ready for. She's not there. And if I push her to go there, she will no longer talk to me. So I'm supporting her process where she is. I'm listening, I'm being patient, I'm being collaborative. I'm giving her the choice. And it, let me not even say it like that. I'm not giving her the choice. Letting her know it is her choice. Take your power back so that she can move in the manner that she needs to move. And I'm just there to support the process. Number four is trust, trustworthiness, task clarity, consistency, and interpersonal boundaries, being respectful and professional boundaries are maintained. They need to know that they can trust you. Here's what I mean. Like I said, survivors need to know that they can trust you. Very important. Keeping your word is important. Please never make a promise to a survivor that you can't keep. I've heard people do that. It's like, don't make a promise you can't keep. Please don't do that. Don't tell them you're gonna do something and then you can't do it. You'll lose all trust. You'll lose all safety. Another thing is we have to be careful with the term confidentiality. <laughs> you know, we like to tell, you know, everything we talk about is confidential just between you and me. That's true. A lot of times that's not true. You know, we give them this disclaimer, you know, if we talk about suicide, homicide, childhood abuse, elderly abuse, even if you do that, you gotta be careful. Because, you know, even within organizations, when I was a therapist in an organization, I would tell them, it is confidential within our organization, unless these certain things. And I would tell them what would happen if these certain things occur. I would also tell them there are some times where 
lawyers have wanted the files and sometimes they have got the files. Like I'm very honest about where the information could go. So even as an advocate, if they come into your church, please don't tell them everything that we talk about stays between you and me. Is that true? Or are you going to another leader in your church? Or are you going to your pastor in your church? Like, don't tell them as, like, be honest about who might receive this information so that if they hear the information somewhere else, they're not stuck on where you, you lied to me. You didn't tell me the truth. So they need to know that they can trust you in your word. So don't just tell them anything just to get what you think you need to get out of them. Be honest. Even if you think, if you say that, they're not going to come back. You have to be 100% honest about everything when talking to a survivor. Please be consistent. Be consistent. You tell them you're going to do this, then be consistent. You tell them you're going to help them here, be consistent, then do it. Be consistent. And you must have interpersonal boundaries. Boy, this sometimes is hard for some people because like I said, we want to rescue folks. <laughs> we want to save the world. We want to rescue everyone. So sometimes some people give survivors their cell phone, personal cell phone number. You might want to be careful with that. I mean, if you do it, that's your choice. That's totally on you. And if you tell them they can call you at any time, you better be consistent and hold to that and be honest with that, you know, I, I know therapists that have done that and they start to give their client their personal cell phone number and say, you can call me at any time. And then when the client called, they didn't answer because the client called about one, two o'clock in the morning because that's when they needed help and they didn't answer. And then the client left a message and then they called the client in the morning. The client's not responding because they did not keep their word. So just as advocates, if you're not ready to be there 24 seven, don't give them this, your cell phone number. You have to have interpersonal boundaries. You have to take care of yourself in this process. That's why I said we can't go into this with a rescue mentality because if you do, you're gonna find yourself stuck and you're gonna find yourself not being trustworthy, you know what I mean? And, and not being consistent to where the client will see you as a liar. So we, we don't never wanna do that. We wanna have those boundaries in how we serve them. You can give them a number, but give them an office number and you give them a time to call, you know, different things like that. You, you work it so where it's supportive to the client and it doesn't come out where you're lying to them. And the fifth thing, the last thing in regards to providing trauma-informed care is empowerment. Prioritizing empowerment and, and skill building. So what is empowerment? Um, it's the process of becoming stronger and more confident, especially in controlling one's life and claiming one's rights. And I underline the word process. Process. <laughs> it is a process. You know, um, I've had a lot of conversation and people would say, I empowered her to do that meaning they just gave it to her and said, go do it. <laughs> no, it is a process, okay? You know, so it, it's a process of them gaining their life back, gaining confidence, getting stronger. And through that, we help them to do that in their time being patient throughout their process also aiding them in building their skills so that they can become more empowered to do what they deem as important. So once again, we will help them and aid them throughout that, that process. What, what, you know, whatever skills they identify that they have, or maybe you I can see some skills, because sometimes survivors don't see what we see as far as their skill level. Um, and what they might be able to do. So we can help them through that process as well. Not telling them, but guiding them, assisting them, helping them. Um, and it says, and providing an atmosphere that allows individuals to feel validated and affirmed with each contact at the organization and or church. Huge piece, 
huge piece. You know, we all want to feel validated, you know? And I think in providing an atmosphere, that's why I'm, I am so excited that this is happening and that this webinar and so the, the work that you have been doing um, in regards to educating yourselves around domestic violence and sexual abuse and other topics. And I, it's so important that the church as a whole, just not our leaders, but that this stuff comes down to the congregation and creating a world where everyone is um, empathetic, um, not sympathetic, but empathetic to survivors, um, empathetic to those that are struggling, you know, so that as folks come into your spaces, they feel validated, they feel confirmed, they feel like, okay, this is a place where I can feel safety, I, I can feel like I can talk about this and I won't be judged, um, or they won't make me stay somewhere I don't want to stay, or they won't force me to stay with my husband or you know they'll understand why i need to do x y and z or if i say i want to stay they understand and they support me like i'm so grateful that this is happening and in promoting trauma informed information in churches and getting it more into our therapy and counseling and psychologists and psychiatrist offices is so so important so that we can begin to serve the clients better than what we've been doing because um, we still have a lot of work to do so when we look at all these these areas safety um very important choice very important collaboration trustworthiness empowerment these are the five pieces when we talk about providing trauma-informed care like i said whether it's with a professional or as you as an advocate or supporter or parent of someone you know that is a survivor these pieces are very important even as a parent and let that that individual know that you're safe with me yes it's your choice yes i will collaborate with you yes i would do all that i can do for you to trust me and i will help to empower you to be able to gain your life back to gain your strength back so it's just not for professionals, but it's for advocates, for parents, for friends, to be able to serve others that are struggling. Because as we know, everyone will not go and see a professional, but they'll come and see you. And they need to know that they can trust you and that you will, um, all these, these five pieces will resonate in you and they will exude through you where you will be able to help me in my time of struggle and need. So in conclusion, when seeking to find a trauma-informed therapist counselor, ask questions. Questions like, have you ever worked with survivors of deviant sexual assault? You know, there are some therapists will, that they'll say, I'm eclectic. I always tell people, if you had a heart problem, who would you go to? I'm hoping you go to a cardiologist and not an eclectic doctor, right? If you had lung problems, I'm hoping you'll go see a pulmonologist and not an eclectic doctor, right? I'm, I want a specialist. Same thing. You want to go see a specialist for someone that when we talk about domestic violence and sexual assault, not just an eclectic therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, and so forth. Um, you want to find someone that is trained working with them. You can ask them, how long have you worked in the field of domestic violence and sexual assault? Not just their sister was a survivor. Um, look at their literature. What does it say? Does it talk about trauma-informed care? Does it list what's important to them in providing trauma-informed care? Um, don't be afraid. I tell people all the time, don't be afraid to interview that professional. You're paying them. So why are we just going to accept anyone that come along? This is your time to interview them. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. You will find out quickly um, whether or not they have their own agenda or if they're seeking to represent the individual. You'll find out very quickly. Um, 
I mentioned this earlier in the why and wanting to become an advocate, an advocate, please do a self-assessment of why you want to serve survivors. Why is it important to you? Very important question to answer for yourself. Many of uh, domestic violence and sexual assault agencies are seeking to provide trauma-informed care. They will tell you that they have been providing these services since conception, but that is always not the case, and therefore trial and error might occur when seeking counseling or supportive services for someone. So once again, you just have to do your homework. Do your own research in seeking out the right service for an individual or for yourself. And I said, I just wanted to give the domestic violence hotline um, number, which is 1-800-799-7233. Once again, that's 1-800-799-7233. So I tried to get through this as fast as I can, because I know we have to have some time um, for question and answer, but hopefully this helped you to gain an understanding, more of trauma-informed care, um, and also doing some, begin to do some little inner work, if you haven't already done that, of why you want to do this work so that you can be a trauma-informed advocate or just a trauma-informed supporter overall. Thank you so much. So I think we're going to look at some Q&As, questions and answers. Can you say more about when clergy and counselors have an obligation to report to authorities in New Jersey? So, when we talk about reporting, um, when we talk about confidentiality, there has to be, we can tell someone that everything that we talk about is confidential, not unless we talk about suicide, homicide, child abuse, or elderly abuse. When we start talking about abuse to someone else or to themselves, then you have to report as a counselor, as a clergy, that is your obligation. But if a survivor comes to you and they tell you, you know, they're being abused by their husband or being abused by their spouse, um, that's confidential, unless those things are involved in that. Um, thus, we know that there is homicide included that could about to be happen upon me or I'm about to do, or, you know, like I said, elderly abuse. So those things you do have to report um, in the state of New Jersey. Do we have any other questions? If there are no more questions, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Can you hear me? No. Yes, I can. Oh. oh. <laughs> Yeah. Um, our next webinar will be on um, elder abuse, and it's scheduled for June twelfth. Uh, the um, we will be posting it uh, as many ways as we can, and would like to uh, welcome you. Thank you for coming today, and welcome you to our future uh, webinars. And God bless and stay safe.